You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Ryan Graves. Ryan Graves is a former Lieutenant U.S. Navy and F-A-18F pilot who served for a decade, including two deployments in Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Inherent Resolve. Graves was the first active duty pilot to come forward publicly about regular sightings of unidentified aerial phenomenon. He is the founder and executive director of Americans for Safe Aerospace, the first military pilot-led non-profit dedicated to UAP as a matter of national security, aerospace safety, and science. He also serves as the first chair of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Unidentified Aerospace Phenomena Integration and Outreach Committee, representing more than 30,000 members of the aerospace industry. The goal of the UAPCOI is to serve as a neutral, scientifically focused group enabling safer commercial and military air and space operations. Ryan Graves, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. All right, I have a burning question that has been bothering me all day. Does it ever get old? Does it ever become just a job to fly an FA-18? In other words, do you still get the same rush from the first time as you do the last time you fly one? Sadly, I'll have to suggest that it, it can fade into one of those things that is a job, so to speak, versus something you want to go out and do. And... I know that intimately just do the, how much work it takes to be at that position and how fragile that information is in that position is. So it's something you need to constantly sprint to maintain. But I know that, you know, you occasionally have those days where the weather rolls in and you know, it's a fun flight, but you still take a, a little sigh of relief that flight's been canceled and you can go back and do normal things for the day. So it can certainly turn into a, a, a job just like anything else on certain times, but It's something that I I certainly wouldn't have traded for the world. It was an incredible experience that was challenging pretty much every single day for almost 11 years. Which part is scarier, actually getting catapulted off of the aircraft carrier or landing? Much so landing. When When you catapult, there comes a time where you've done all the checks you need to do and others have confirmed your aircraft is in the right operational state. You're literally locked into a catapult system and compressed down, pulled down and essentially the uh, the hammer has been pulled back. At that point, you're not even touching the stick. You've saluted the officer and your hand's off the stick and, and grabbing something actually that's almost at eye level, just a handbar. And you're essentially along for the ride at that point. But landing on the boat, you have every opportunity to screw it up all the way to the very, very end. <laughs> So there's really, there's really never a point where you're just strapped in off of a ride. There's, you're always trying to optimize and, and manage that flight. And then even after you land, even after you feel like you can take the pack off, for example, it could be nighttime and now you have to tack you very close to the edge of the ship. So you really can't let the pack off at all. Now, in aviation with, with landing on an aircraft carrier which we've done since before World War II, do you think they had it easier back then with prop aircraft versus modern jet aircraft? Well, in one way, they certainly did. Because back in the day, they didn't have angled decks on the carrier. So it was kind of, you had one shot and the margin for error was relatively large. You more or less had to get it on deck and then it would essentially drive itself into some wires. Aircraft would get hit by vertically stacked wires. So it was going to stop. Now, if you were too high and, and you got caught in those wires the wrong way, it would it would certainly be nasty. And I'm being a bit facetious here because obviously it was extremely dangerous uh, what they were doing. But in a way, it was it was almost a, a wider margin of, of error, although the consequences were, were much d- dire. Now, what is a typical deployment on an aircraft carrier like as a pilot? How much time do you spend per year on ship when you're on active duty like that? So I'll, 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 I'll add a different cohort in there. We kind of segregate our activities in the Navy, what we call shore tour or essentially in a state where you're deployable. And so for that, that sea duty, essentially as, as, as aviators, that's a three to three and a half year period where we're deployable. 
Some people may not deploy that much during that window, although most likely some. Some people might be gone for the majority of those three years. The average is, of course, somewhere near the middle. For uh, an average aviator, he might be deployed for perhaps 18 months, up to 24 months, perhaps, uh, of those 36 to mid-40 months. So they're going, they can be gone quite a bit. The actual time you're gone on the boat ranges anywhere upwards of 7 to, to 12 to 13 months, depending on the deployment and the needs of the Navy. But there's also a pretty significant workup cycle that happens before you actually go out on that deployment. And that's often more challenging and more dangerous than the actual deployment itself. And typically involve us being gone for a month or more at a time for up to within every other month or so, up to six months before we even leave. Now, when you're out at sea, this is this is a Navy, you know, this is military. You're going to get spied on by other nation states, drones and things like that, your carrier group. Does that in itself, before we even get to the question of UAP, does that in itself pose an aviation hazard? Oh, absolutely. Now, the traditional, without getting too much into me, and traditionally, we would perhaps stay away from a particular area in the vicinity of a carrier, perhaps if there was some type of intelligence gathering asset, something of that nature. Typically, we don't see foreign adversaries sending up small air assets to, quote unquote, get a closer look. That's not necessarily how we operate. So generally speaking, there's not as urgent and and present risk of that type of activity from normal type of surveillance, such as what we would see perhaps during a workup or operating within the uh, confines of an operating zone, perhaps, or near one. Now, these operating zones are typically off the coast of either coast of the U.S., right? So they're not that far from the mainland, is my understanding. Yes. So really anything off of international waters off the coast is more or less free game if a foreign military wanted to send some type of ship-based asset to, say, follow an aircraft strike group if they were able to do so. And that, you know, that starts depending on the area about 100 miles or so off the coast. But I was actually speaking more broadly in that we were, you know, operational areas such as uh, the Sea of Japan, uh, where the Navy has a a relatively large presence, as well as in in the Middle East as well. Now, about the UAP, your main concern with this phenomenon, whatever it may be, is aviation safety. Do those things, whatever they are, scare you more than a Chinese drone would? In other words, is it a true wild card as to what it is when it's an unknown? It is, you know, so back to your, your, your previous question, you know, we typically don't necessarily, we don't expect to see foreign adversaries doing essentially close aboard observation of our, of our aircraft. That's just not how the game is, is necessarily played in our mo- modern electronic warfare environment, a cyber warfare environment. So to your point, you know, it causes us tactical and, and it has the potential to be a safety hazard when adversaries do their kind of run of the mill spying on us around our, our serious uh, assets like that. But the UAP presence that we've had it has been more in our face. It's been in our airspace. It's been near board in some cases, almost hitting our aircraft. And these aren't behaviors that we would expect to observe from a foreign adversary that's trying to spy on us. They would try to be subtle. They wouldn't necessarily have the need to be that close to us unless there were some type of harassment objective based off of it. But that's, you know, that's a completely different category of behavior than what we'd expect an adversary to display if they were trying to gather intelligence of our operations. Now, given your experience and the people you knew on, in the Navy, did you get a sense that whatever the UAP are, were they trying to get your attention or were they just acting as though you weren't there? Yeah, you know, it's it's tough to, to answer that. If we look at a macro view, the objects were clearly centered, at least during 2014, 2015 time period, they were clearly organized around our working areas. And the working areas are rather large, but the activity was centered around those areas, although they were not respecting the exterior boundaries of those areas. So they would spill out, as we would say, out of the area uh, at whim as if they didn't care about the boundary, and yet they were still somewhat centered, they were centered within those boundaries. In that context, it leads me to believe that there was intention to their location, but they did not seem to react to us on an individual basis on the micro scale. So if we, you know, they didn't seem to be you know, mirroring us or flying next to us, things of that nature, at least, you know, and I'm talking about my first person kind of experience here. 
I've since heard of other behaviors like that, but at the time, that's this is my experience, is that we, we weren't having them you know react to us. I, I and we, when I would fly by it, we would think we would be able to see them or capture them based off of our sensors, but we couldn't see them. And we still don't know if that's some due to some call it pilot error, or whether some kind of call it cloaking, or whether they're physically moving out of the way at the last minute, perhaps, which would constitute some type of reaction, perhaps. But not, nothing that would I would say is an acute reaction that would cause me to believe that we could, that I would deem as communication perhaps, right? Or, or pure reaction. Now, instrumentation, and I don't want to get too deeply into this because it's <laughs> instruments, but did you ever get the sense that this thing might be jamming your radar or trying to confound a sensor or something like that, just going out of its way to muddy the water, as it were? So th- it's a good question, and it's a complicated one. <laughs> So I'll try not to go into too much, but generally speaking, you know, an F-18 doesn't necessarily have the tools in order to be able to interact with things outside of a very narrow scope of expected behavior. What that means is, you know, we're looking for jets and those jets are putting out certain waveforms and those waveforms should look like this. And if they look like that, then my system is going to show me something. We're not, it's not interpreting what it's seeing in any type of broader context. So when we might receive jamming signals on our display from these systems, it doesn't necessarily mean we're being jammed by these objects per se. It, it's more likely that the, the signal that is being reflected is being modified in some manner, and therefore the system is just happened to interpret it that way because it falls uh, near that spectrum uh, of frequency. So that's how I think about jamming. Now, the IR indications we received from these objects, in my personal experience, looked like someone was shining an IR flashlight at us. That could potentially be a type of IR masking, perhaps, uh, whether intentional or not. So that could also potentially be some type of visual or IR jamming in those particular cases. Did you observe any of these objects violating the laws of physics? And that's always brought up with, with this topic is that there are some of them seem to be going against the wind or things like that. Did you see anything that would lead you to believe that you were looking at a piece of technology rather than something like a plasma or some, you know, something like that? Uh, I think there might've been two questions in there. So I think the first question might've been more around, have we seen something that lets me, you know, conclusively say it's breaking the laws of physics. I think the second one was maybe more around, was there behavior that observed that could be considered intelligent? Is that a fair, maybe, interpretation of the question? Sure. Yeah, go with it. So on the latter of the question, although they weren't responding to us, we did observe behavior at times that did appear to indicate coordination across the assets, right? So they're at the macro scale, the fact that they were kind of within the vicinity of our areas. But more specifically, there were times when these things appeared to fly in formation, where they reversed directions very suddenly, uh, where they were, you know, very clearly maneuvering at high air speeds or an organized fashion, such as a circular or racetrack pattern. So there certainly was indications of intelligent control, you know, if nothing else, other than say like a weather phenomenon that was just outside the boundaries of, of normal, if that makes sense. And on the former part of the question, so, you know, have we observed anything that, you know, we could say, well, that, you know, is breaking the laws of physics in a way that so, you know, it's even hard for me to kind of stage the question because that's, you know, that's a statement I think that gets thrown around a lot that doesn't have that much real meaning when you start to peel it back. Breaking known physics is is kind of a broad statement. So is it performing? One way I think of about it is very basic kind of first principles. There's essentially energy and energy storage, right? So if these things are doing high energy maneuvers for long periods of time and the amount of energy it would take to perform those maneuvers don't make sense, I wouldn't call that be beyond known physics, but it's not something within our normal inventory. And that same logic applies for performance characteristics associated with the energy requirements as well. So for example, based off of what I can say we know as far as Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, they said about 50% of their cases are spherical objects that are traveling anywhere between 0.0 and 2 Mach. 2 Mach is, you know, can be dependent on altitude, but we're looking at about 1,500 miles an hour or so. A sphere is not an aerodynamic shape. 
And yet we're seeing these things whiz around at Mach 2, apparently disregarding friction, air friction, things of that nature. We're not seeing exhaust or normal propulsive systems or propellers. And they're doing these for such long periods of time that, again, back to that kind of first principle approach, where what's what's powering this? You know, what is it? We just don't have an answer for them. I do not envy Dr. Kirkpatrick's position in trying to have to figure this out because that's I mean, what do you what do you even start to measure when you have something that's not reacting with the atmosphere friction wise? I mean, what do you have to work with other than trying to get measurements? But the thing is, as you said, an FA-18 is not designed as a platform to study UAP. <laughs> it's designed as a platform to look at rival aircraft. So the the question is, is what what do you think the Navy could do to actually collect data on these things? Is there is there even a starting point, really, as far as to what they could deploy to uh, give Arrow some data? Yeah, I think there's a lot of data that can be gathered. So what we've really been seeing, a lot of the action and, and effort that we've seen that's been happening lately isn't due to some historical database that has suddenly been revealed and now we're reacting to it. It's due to reporting that basically started in the 2018 time period with the Navy. And so what they're receiving are essentially reports from tactical aviators, primarily. They're the ones that have the systems to detect these objects. And they're reporting what they're seeing. And that data has eventually led to some of the legislative action that we're seeing now. And so just as a, at a very basic level, just treating this as any other normal aviation safety hazard, just being able to re safely report, track, and therefore mitigate this as a hazard is going to generate data, both on the frequency, the location, the detection mechanisms, proximity to bases, things of that nature. So we can start eliminating some of the factors. And most of these objects, right, are not going to be truly mysterious. They're likely going to flesh out as either something prosaic or perhaps as adversarial platforms are taking advantage of the domain awareness gap in order to infiltrate our airspace. But we have to be ready to react to that. So even just gathering more of this data from the military pilots and then expanding that all the way across, not just the fleet and the Navy, but services wide across the entire DOD to not only sure that the, the reporting continues, but it expands and that the pilots and aviators and other service people who are reaching out to me through my efforts to tell me about what they're experiencing have an actual mechanism to do so within the DOD. And we're seeing the same thing on the commercial side as well. So commercial pilots are, you know, they're gathering a lot of information with their eyeballs as well. They're seeing occurrences on their flights on a pretty much regular basis. And this is all, yes, it's anecdotal data, but if we gather it en masse, we can perform analysis and start to pull out critical data from it. There's also, you know, actual technological solutions, of course, that make sense as well. To your point, yes, they don't react necessarily, but we know for a fact we can detect them with various systems. Just, you know, we were doing that with our jets. So those systems aren't necessarily unique to the F-18. There are, you know, ways to commercialize that technology and be able to expand our ability to detect these objects. And that's just one known method. There are likely other ones that are potentially less expensive that could be distributed so we can get more information about what's in our airspace from technological means as well. Now, the commercial side of this, what are the altitudes like for these sightings? And is that a problem for a typical altitude for a commercial jet? I mean, could could we conceivably see a day, God forbid, that a commercial jet airliner is down by hitting one of these things? So again, back to all the main anomaly resolution office uh, in their last report, I think the most current was in the NASA independent study team public meeting that occurred recently. Sean communicated that the majority of these sightings within their database are being reported under 30,000 feet. So primarily where commercial air traffic is located. There's likely observation bias with that. So it's not to say it isn't happening elsewhere. We just don't necessarily have the assets to see at those altitudes as easily. But the point remains that it is occurring to a significant degree at altitudes that commercial airliners operate at, but also happening much above their altitude as well. And I've been speaking to a lot of commercial pilots who've been telling me different situations that have occurred both at altitudes that were their altitude and they're actively engaged with air traffic control and other aircraft to try to figure out what these objects are and to ensure no one hits it. I'm also hearing stories about how pilots are seeing objects at high, alt high, high altitudes above them and they're operating at 40,000 feet. They're seeing things at altitudes they can't even assess, but look, you know, well above their altitudes. 
they're performing in, in interesting ways. And these are all perhaps not going to result in, in a in a midair, but these are all pilot distractions. We mitigate pilot distractions and these potential hazards by reporting them and tracking them. And right now, commercial pilots don't have the agency and they don't feel safe to even talk about this, never mind report it. Now, when you were in the Navy, though, was there anything, any way to report this or were you just keep your mouth shut? What was the climate before the recent happenings when destigmatization and everything else that, you know, they, they mentioned in the congressional hearings? It just didn't exist. There was nothing to report to as far as I knew or anyone else, you know, that I spoke to knew. Even if it was a potential security threat, which we thought it was perhaps, um, there really was nowhere to communicate it to other than to run it up our chain. The only other option was for us to submit hazard reports through the aviation safety reporting system or, or center. That's not a proactive investigatory system. That's simply a data tracking so that if something happens, you can go back and do an assessment. So it's it, that wasn't something that was ever expected to resolve the issue, but we submitted it. We submitted hazard reports through that system because we didn't know what else to do. And we were afraid we we're going to hit one of these things. And we just wanted to start tracking it so that if it was one of our objects or something that someone perhaps would see that they were operating where they shouldn't and they would perhaps see the message that way because we didn't know what else to do. Now, since going public with this and entering the public debate on the issue, does it surprise you the amount of pilots that are coming to you with counts? Oh, yeah. I, I knew I like I, I knew I had a subjective feeling that there were a lot out there, but I, I didn't, I didn't realize how many there were, and I didn't realize just how much this was happening and how regularly this was occurring for commercial pilots. I was spoiled with my sensors, so, you know, we can look out with our radar and see wide swaths of airspace, but, you know, I understood that commercial pilots, they just don't have those tools, and so the probability of them seeing things would be much lower. So the fact that all these guys and gals are reaching out to me and not only are they reaching out, but then telling me that everyone is talking about this now. A lot, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of these aircraft talk about it now. It's the stigma is being removed. We're all learning just how common this is. Yeah, surprisingly common. Is there anything that you're aware of on the FAA front to give the commercial pilots a way to report these incidences? No, it doesn't seem there is. The FAA, there was a FAA spokesperson at the NASA Independent Study Team public meeting. And what I took away from that conversation was that they do not see themselves as playing a role in the pilot reporting on this topic. They did communicate that they were receiving some number of monthly reports from ATC, but they did not have any type of internal process for either collating or, or investigating those reports in any fashion, other than to refer them to outside public agencies or organizations such as MUFON and things of that nature. You'd think that they would be more interested, though, given the aviation safety aspect of this, because it seems to me that the one thing that we can say about this whole thing is that there appears to be a problem, even with just balloons. Now, again, we had Balloon Gate with the, uh, the Chinese balloons and lots and lots of privately launched balloons and things like that. Do those pose a separate hazard for aircraft at this point? Well, that goes to a broader point. I don't think these are two different conversations because they're both dealing with the same thing, which is uncertainty in our airspace. So you know, I've recently started a, a, a nonprofit organization called Americans for Safe Aerospace. And this is exactly how we think about this topic. Um, it's all about uncertainty and uncorrelated targets and, and undesignated targets and all the different terms that we have in the military for uncertainty in the battle space. Those same concepts uh, apply over the continental United States as well. And whether it's a quote unquote UAP or perhaps a Chinese spy balloon, that's a decision. That's a determination for down the road. We're, we're up at the point where we're saying, hey, we have less certainty about what's in our sky than we thought. Let's figure out what's above our heads. Let's make sure we tune our sensors correctly and make sure we're looking for everything. Because guess what? There are things that are operating at low air speeds. There are things that are operating at zero airspeed. Some of these are performing very interesting behaviors that are frankly startling, and we're classifying those as UAP. Some of these are likely adversarial spy platforms, and we're seeing those fall out as we do a deeper dive into our airspace. And so for us, it's all about dealing with that uncertainty. And then as we gather more information about that case, hey, is this a national security issue? Yes, no. Let's prosecute that through the appropriate resources of the DOD. And if it's not, we need to ensure that our commercial air traffic is aware and secure of the threat 
And then we need to be scientifically curious about what that is so we can we can adapt and learn about what it is. You know, just going based on uh, Kirkpatrick's statements, the idea of a metallic spherical object traveling at Mach 2, <laughs> it's not, that's dangerous. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's dangerous. Might as well be a missile. Might as well be a missile. And even if it hit the ground, there's all kinds of questions you could ask. So I, I wonder, we have to separate the possible causes, the unknowns, from the actual fact that there's an aviation hazard here, right? And it seems to me that's the first step in, in the debate of this is just, okay, set the origins aside. Everybody can speculate all I want. We'll just set that aside. What we need to deal with is the reality of the problem and recognize that there is a problem. Do you have any blowback against that approach, though? In other words, do people say, well, this UFO stuff is crazy, so don't even look into it? Or do you just say, hey, no, this is, there's an actual problem here we can see on radar and there's something there? Well, that's been my communication North Star, if you will. You know, I'm not here to speculate about conclusions, right? Because there's so many of them and there's just simply not enough data to make those conclusions, at least based off of what I've been able to see. And so it's just way too early in that conversation. But what I do know is that not only did I see something and report it, but it wasn't me. It was it was a lot of people on the East Coast and our systems are connected across multiple sensors that are disparate sensors across different spectrums, IR cameras and radar systems and visual eyeballs and other things. And these things are being shared across multiple platforms. So there's instant correlation across multiple platforms. So, you know, what we're seeing today, I think, is just an entirely different class of, of data set on this. And it hasn't always been possible to gather this much information uh, about this. So one question that people ask me, you know, is why do we think this is happening now? But I think with the amount of information that, that's just being gathered up and distributed, it's almost inevitable. Do you think there was a bias in this, in, in the way that the armed forces were looking at this? In other words... Were they simply taking this from the position that we don't know what they are, but we know they're not Russian or Chinese, therefore it doesn't really matter? Do you think that was their position or do you think they might have known more than they have let on? I think that's something, uh, you know, hopefully that we'll learn. I don't I don't necessarily have the answer for that. From my perspective, this just was a problem that didn't exist. This was a non-issue, but I, I, I wish I could answer that more fully and more accurately. Now, other dangers. When you're, when, this is another aircraft carrier question, I can't stop myself. When you're closer to shore, how much of a problem are birds? We have a little bit of a problem with birds sometimes with commercial flights taking off on, from land. But if you're close to shore and you're taking off, it seems to me that that might be a somewhat of a problem for a plane like an F-A-18. Yeah, bird strikes are a serious issue. I actually thought they did a fantastic job in the new Top Gun movie where they had a bird strike in the film. And it was, it was great because it, it happened when you least expected it, more or less, which is always when those things happen. But I'm not an expert in this. I'm sure there's some things I'm going to say that are not exactly correct here, but birds are a massive issue for us. Migratory birds are, are one category of issue. So you can be in the, kind of in the middle of nowhere. You know, I remember we used to have issues at a particular airfield that was kind of in the middle of nowhere. We just happened to be, you know, twice a year among a, uh, a pretty major migratory path for birds so it's very sporadic other fields will have large grass areas around it and there'll be birds that will go onto the runway and hunt mice and snakes and things of that nature and so you can get hit on the runway not even knowing it because a bird comes out trying to snag something on the ship even on the aircraft carrier we'll sometimes when we're somewhat near port i don't know if they've gone across the atlantic with us but birds will post up on the on the aircraft carrier itself or among the different ships in the strike group and you'll have birds potentially, I think I've even seen a bird strike essentially out in blue water from a seagull that was hanging out on the carrier. So they're always a problem, <laughs> just, you know, different flavors for different places, I guess. Yeah, I guess you're really only safe if you're way out at sea, away from any sort of land with birds. And even then, I think they're actually migratory, yeah. I don't even think so. I mean, honestly, the only time I feel comfortable away from birds is if I'm above, like... Right. So what is the ceiling of, of an F-18? 15,000 feet. Uh, we'll typically operate in the vicinity, no higher, well, practically speaking, around like 35,000 feet or so. So not that dissimilar from a commercial aircraft? Yeah, you know, it's highly dependent on our loadout, uh, our weight, what we're carrying. Those are all different words for the same thing, but one's for fuel, one could be weapons, loadout, things of that nature, centerline tanks. So 
it's pretty highly dependent on all that good stuff, but we're not going in the stratosphere. I think the exact ceiling is is technically classified. Do you miss it? Do you miss uh, hopping in the cockpit of a, of a fighter jet like that? <sighs> yeah, I, you know, strapping in was like always like a super pleasurable experience for me. <laughs> you know, just just getting from cold jet to pre-flighting, walking around it, hopping in, as we call it, building our nest and getting everything fired up. I mean, just uh, the whole experience was was great. <laughs> but the hard part comes, especially in the tactical community, is all the work that it, it entails to stay at the top of your game in that type of field. It, we fly hard when we fly. It's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of mental work and training and preparation. You can only be in that, that whirlwind for so much time, in a sense. So in a sense, I don't miss that whirlwind and that effort and that constant challenge and fight to be as good as you can. It takes a lot. But I, I do miss being at that point, having the, the confidence to be able to strap into that type of machine and, and go fly with potentially 12 of my best buddies out to do an incredible mission and then come back and do it again the next day. Do you still, uh, in private life, do you still fly? I don't right now. I'm not necessarily choosing not to. It's just so much harder on the outside. Find something that would be both entertaining and, and affordable and also exist within a decent proximity to me. So... I'm not opposed. I'm 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 open to opportunities, but haven't quite found the right situation. Now, if you were to advise the Navy today, as far as looking into this, and say you, say you were sitting down with Kirkpatrick to talk to him, what would you tell the Navy as far as this phenomenon, as to a course of action to deal with it and figure it out? Yeah, I think it really comes down to at this point, really one thing, and that's just breaking down the remaining stigma walls. They have the right tools. They understand that the problem is there. What I think they need to do is to keep the pedal down in is ensuring the middle management of Department of Defense, of Navy, and of the other services buy into the fact that this is something that we need to gather data on and for very pragmatic reasons. We don't necessarily need to think about it from the military being involved with back engineering, spaceships, things of that nature. There, you know, this is very pragmatic safety issue that we can attack using normal safety rules, using some sensors, and we can gather more data. I would also like to add that we need to take that data that's being generated from those aviators and those lessons learned, and we need to ensure we can promulgate that to the commercial markets, to the civil sector, because this problem is happening there as well. It's Ignorance is not necessarily bliss. They don't have the sensors, but they do have the problem. And so we need to be able to leverage those lessons learned to be be able to keep our our civil sector safe as well. Now, in an encounter, say the the closest one that you had, what did you see specifically? What did the object look like? So I struggled to see these with my own eyes. And that was kind of the status quo for most of us. We would see them on our radar. We would have them on our FLIR we would get what we call a missile tone and that means our ir missile its separate seeker head has uh, gained a uh, a lock on the object and we would take all these sensors into what we call the merge or we'd fly right up to the object within 500 feet to try to gain that tally gain that that eyeball sight of the object and and we couldn't all this information be projected into our visor and we would be looking where it's telling us to look and the object was not there according to our eyeballs. And that was status quo, at least initially, until we almost hit one of these objects when they were right at the entrance to our working areas. And this first time it happened, it was it was two guys in my squadron, two aircraft, I should say, four people. It went right between the lead aircraft and the second aircraft who were about 150 feet apart. And the lead aircraft, he got a good look at it and he, he described it as a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere where the apex of the cube are touching the inside of the sphere, best you could tell. See, that's that's strange because that's not, doesn't sound like a balloon, maybe a radar reflector or something like that, but you would see the balloon <laughs> that it's hanging from if it were there. So it's very puzzling. Yeah, and this, this, this object was directly at the GPS location for the entrance to these working areas. That was, that was strange and nothing stays stationed in the air unless it's tethered down. Uh, not to, especially not to the degree we were seeing these objects were essentially frozen at a point in the sky. So this object was right at the entrance to the working area. I mean, they never had it on their radar, unfortunately, in this particular case. Was that coordinate classified? I mean, was that restricted information? 
No, it's, I mean, I, I, it's probably officially CUS only. I, I don't have it, but it's right at the Whiskey 72, one of the westernmost, northwesternmost points there, more or less, within probably 50 miles of that, about 10 or 12,000 feet. So it's right at altitude, right at, you know, it's all the, all the traffic that goes in enters at 12,000 feet and all the traffic that leaves, like, leaves a thousand feet lower. So it was, you know, boom, right at the entry altitude and point. And then we were seeing these, I, I wasn't, we weren't investigating these. So I'm trying to speak about my first hand experiences and our lack of knowledge at the time. But now that I've looked into this more and I've, I've seen some of the other safety reports that have come out, that is a, is a primary shape that was seen. I have 15 or so pilots, probably more at this point have reported seeing that similar shape, a cube and a sphere. And they've reported seeing them all the way up to now, you know, modern times. I think the last case was eight months ago or so, maybe technically last year. So they're still seeing these objects. They're still performing in strange ways. Had them fly up the jets and hang out by the cockpit and then dart off. Again, that wasn't my story at the time, but I've since learned that through various reports that have come out. So there's there's some certainly some interesting reports. You can actually for, you can actually search some of the call them range fowler reports that have been released via FOIA. They redact decent amount of information, but you can very clearly see that there's something strange going on. These pilots don't know what they're seeing. As opposed to seeing something that's ours, a secret aircraft, if these were that, you would think that they would be coming after you with NDAs and everything if you spotted something like that. Am I right? And that with these, that it doesn't appear that there's anything classified about them. We just don't know what they are. Yeah, that's right. So I, um, I think it's a bit of a lazy way to answer it that way, but considering now it's almost been nine years later, let's get to the point where it's like, if this was our own classified technology, like why are we still investigating this issue, right? I feel like that's slightly lazy of an answer, but it's the reality of the situation. You know, this has congressional action. There's legislation that's being passed. If this is truly the fact that we have what we call a blue on blue from a classified program at this point, then God help us. We, we really put our foot in our mouth at this point. It just doesn't seem like a practical solution based off of all the energy and action that's been put into this to figure out what this is at this point. And there's also the age of the phenomenon because there are reports obviously going back to the 1940s in the modern era. And some of them look like this kind of thing. And the bottom line is no one had any technology like that back then. <laughs> yeah, things get much harder to account for when you consider any time outside of basically these modern reports and the fact that these were apparently cropping up elsewhere. And that's something I learned not too long ago myself. Do you have anybody from other militaries contacting you and saying that they're seeing the same thing? I mean, what is the, the international sense of this, if, if anybody's contacted you regarding this? What do the French see up on their aircraft carrier, things like that? Yeah, there are certain, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I will say that there is communication from other uh, allied nations who have communicated similar issues, but I don't want to get overly specific. How about people in the Air Force? Do 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 we see these things over land? I mean, are they? They seem to be almost uh, mum on the whole issue, and they're not really weighing in. Have you heard anything from Air Force pilots that say, "Yeah, we see the same things you guys see in the Navy"? Yeah, there's there, pilots are seeing the same thing. Absolutely, no question to ask. And I, but to the question of why the Air Force has taken their particular communication strategy as it is. I don't have an answer for that, but the bottom line is they have as good a sensors as the Navy. This is ubiquitous problem. So the question isn't, well, are they seeing something? It's why are they not participating in the process that Congress has set out? It's strange. It may simply, in fairness, it may simply be that they, they're like, we looked into it. It was called Project Blue Book. We're done. You know, it may simply be something like that. Or Well, they... considering that they have a significant role to play in the defense of our continental airspace and that we've recently detected slow-moving Chinese spy balloons over our airspace, I don't think that's an appropriate stance for them to take. No, especially with the spy balloons. Because again, it's not about drawing conclusions to what objects are. It's about accepting that there's uncertainty and, and dealing with it systematically. Yeah, that's a that's a big question is that how did we not know? And it was because we were using filters on radar. You, know, you don't see the balloons because you're you're filtering them out because you're interested in commercial aircraft flights. So they, the radar and then once they pull the filters off, all of a sudden we see these balloons. But yeah, that's a it's a it's a question. And the other question is that if you can overfly the United States with a giant spy balloon, then how much data did they gather? You know, it must have been some kind of a compromise. Even if you're hiding your jets or whatever, putting everything in the hangars as it passes over, it's still, 
that's a major violation of U.S. airspace. And I don't see that problem ending anytime soon. I agree with you. And that's why we need to enable our commercial pilots to feel comfortable reporting things that are out of norm and out of standard. We have to ensure that there are appropriate places that receive that information and that can channel that information to appropriate authorities. These are some of the policy positions that we're going to be pushing at Americans for Safe Aerospace, which again is a nonprofit that I helped recently start to essentially figure out what is in our skies and help bring together and support the stakeholders, pilots, scientists, and engineers that can help us figure this out. We have a website, safeaerospace.org, where people can go. They can sign up and show their support. That's one of the biggest things you can do right now is to show people on Capitol Hill that their constituents care about this issue, that they have support to look into it at this kind of critical phase as it's being introduced to more people in Congress. So I would encourage people, again, go to safeaerospace.org, sign up, even if you're international, to show that you care about this. And we're going to be able to take that message and, and help recommend legislation and policies so that commercial pilots and others feel comfortable reporting on this. Tell us about the Merged Podcast. Absolutely. So it was just a need that essentially was identified much much like Americans for Safe Aerospace, where pilots didn't have an opportunity to share what they were experiencing. And I wanted, I was getting all these private communications and I was hearing a lot of anger at how the, the mainstream media was treating this topic. People felt like it was important and that there was a real issue. And yet they didn't want to risk their career by going on whatever news station and having the X-Files theme play behind them. And so I took that to heart. And so I, I built a podcast so I could provide more or less a safe place where we can have a serious conversation about what they're seeing and discuss it rationally, pilot the pilot and share those experiences. There's other people engaged in this community, such as scientists, such as Dr. Avi Loeb, Dr. Robin Hanson and others that we've recently engaged with. And we're going to be engaging soon with technologists. We want to start identifying some of the technologies that we've been seeing in some of these efforts that can help us learn more about these objects. And we want to start highlighting those and communicating to the industry so that others can get on board and start uh, working this problem with us. All right, Ryan, thanks for joining us today. And I wish you great luck in your endeavors. And I look forward to trying to unravel this as best we can. But the one thing I fear is that in 100 years from now, we'll still be seeing them. We still don't know what they are. I think it'll take a lot less time than that. Thanks for having me today. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. Anna, why is the possum holding a top secret stamp? More importantly, why is he wearing a shirt that says, The Government? He's instituting a classification system, John, for sensitive material. Wait a minute. Every time he stamps something, it disappears. That's because it's secret, John. Hold on. He just classified my cookies. And there goes the dogs playing poker painting. And the boxed wine. And there goes the pirate hat. Sprocket. Don't you dare. Wait a minute, Anna?